Hey guys, Adam Savage here in my cave, and I want to talk about The Mandalorian. Yeah, I, I'm as obsessed with you are at how great season one was, and I'm as excited as you are about season two. But one of the things I want to talk about today is that season one utilized some genuine old school awesome ILM technology, and it has motion control shots. That means the Razor Crest was built by my friend John Goodson as a physical model two feet long, and they had 17, I think, motion control shots. There's a beautiful little featurette from ILM up on YouTube right now. This is the technology that they were using back when I worked at ILM, but no one's touched it in well over a decade. And the two people most responsible for this process Model maker John Goodson and VFX supervisor John Knoll, both of them great friends of mine, and we're going to talk on Zoom about how this came to be and how they did it. Well, John and John, it is really good to see you guys. How how are you on this fine day? Very well, and you? I, I'm pretty good. I'm holding up. I get to come to the shop a lot. Um, so. I was super excited when The Mandalorian was announced. I was excited when I started to see some trailers, but I got really excited when I found out that there are some good, honest to goodness models in this show and <laughs> motion control shots. And I guess yeah. the first thing I want to know is how the heck did that come about? What What, what is the origin story yeah. of, of, of these shots? Well, uh, it, it started from, um, you know, we built a, this, Really beautiful CG model of the the Razor Crest, uh, but these you know high high shine uh, metallic finishes. Um, you, you'd think they would be easy to do in computer graphics, but there's a, a great deal of subtlety to them, and and trying to get them to really look right is is challenging. But I felt like we were in pretty good shape on it. We had a, a couple of shots that we were doing uh, that were space flybys of the of the Razor Crest, and um, John Favreau. Uh, was eyeing them a bit suspiciously, saying, you know, there's something, I don't know, about the reflectivity just doesn't seem right. And he said, I, I think we should build a model. I think we should build a reference model, uh, shoot some stills of it, um, and that'll tell us something about, um, you know, what's, what's not right about this. And, uh, um, and we thought that uh, if we build a model that's, that's good enough for reference pictures, uh, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we actually used it to do some shots? Um, it's not too big a leap to go from a really nice maquette to something that's shootable. Yeah, and wouldn't that be fun to do some motion control work on it? Um, but the big problem for us was that, uh, you know, as as a much of a prestige project as uh, as Mandalorian is, it's still relatively low budget compared to the features that we work on. And at this point, we had already had all of our budgets uh, uh, approved for doing all the shot work. And you know, one of the reasons why you don't see it as much miniature and motion control work these days is it's more expensive to execute than computer graphics. And uh, not a lot of clients want to pay for that. And, uh, and so part of the challenge was, is there a way we can do this on the cheap? Because if we turn this into a great big production, um, you know the costs are going to escalate out of control, and uh, and we won't be able to afford it. So the only way this is really going to be practical, if we is if we uh, treat this as a total garage operation. You know, it's uh, uh, it's it's got to be done um, using uh, as much sort of off-the-shelf commodity equipment and uh, and kind of seat of the pants um, slab test kind of. But I mean, you could. spent. You spent the first couple of decades of your career like living, eating, eating, sleeping, and breathing this process. Oh yeah. But in the interim, since you since CG has become ascendant, the the robot and DIY and Arduino marketplace has become so much more uh, exactly. uh, 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 expansive. That must have made it. So I'm curious about the process of like wrapping your head around an old process and finding yeah. out that there's this new way to do it. Well. Yeah, I, I started my career as a model maker, and then I transitioned into motion control camera. And um, I used some of the, you know, partly how I got into motion control is I started building motion control equipment. Um, <laughs> like I, you do? <laughs> well, that was, uh, you know, this this was back in the early 80s when anybody who had a motion control system was, had built it themselves. Um, there were no companies that were commercially selling them at the time. And I got fascinated by these cameras. And I thought they were super cool, and uh, and I thought, you know, I want to I want to build one. Uh, and 
I was a college student at the time. I was going to USC, and my final project at uh, USC was in an advanced animation class where I built a four-channel motion control system that I I bolted onto an Oxbury animation stand at the school, and uh, I shot a two-minute slit scan movie that was an art exploration of the technique, and that was the last thing I did there. It worked. It was great. It was really fun. Uh, the whole thing kind of operated uh, under computer control. Uh, and I showed that at my job interview at ILM and partly on the strength of that work. That's what got me hired into the camera department. Uh, so for the first few years at ILM, uh, I was doing motion control all day, every day. And then gradually uh, uh, I started moving up into uh, the computer graphics department and then uh, supervision. And, and I stopped doing that. And about 10 years ago, I was working on a, a fun little project that uh, where I needed to do some uh, electronics and uh, started learning the whole uh, hobby electronics world, which has transformed uh, you know, radically over the, the decades. It's, amazing. it's super yeah. cool now. Um, you know, with uh, the, the Arduino community is, uh, is really wonderful. Uh, and Places like uh, Adafruit and SparkFun that uh, mm -hmm. that make all these wonderful little breakout boards that uh, give access um, uh, to hobbyists to you know tiny little uh, packages that you could never solder to manually, um, and you know, have all these libraries that make them very easy to use. It's it's fantastic. Uh, you know, and it used to be that a lot of the motion control equipment that we used was very expensive, but uh, 3D printers and CNC routers and those kinds of things have driven the price of a lot of those things down. The and linear so, bearings and the, and the yeah. steppers and all of that, the economy of scale has made it all much more affordable. Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, when this project came up, um, you know, the, the thought, my first thought was, could I put together a very inexpensive system because we couldn't afford anything particularly <laughs> expensive uh, that could actually shoot these, these elements. And, you know, first thought was, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the 80-20 um, you know, aluminum extrusion uh, uh, rapid prototyping system uh, to see how much of the structure could I build out of 80-20 uh, and minimize the number of things that I actually had to machine from scratch to, to build it. And, you know, probably the, the, the two biggest things I had to, to machine to scra from scratch were uh, pan tilt head. That's what this is. So I built this in my garage. <laughs> this is uh, a floating L pan tilt head uh, and a uh, little Omega drive uh, track. Um, and I'm assuming you sent it out to have it anodized black? I did, yeah. Um, Sexy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a reason why that equipment's black is, uh, is yeah. that, you know, especially you have a, a silver spaceship, uh, any stray light bouncing onto the equipment is going to you know, be visible in the ship. So, so I'm curious if there's a moment at which you got to tell Favreau. He visited the set of MythBusters years ago, and yeah. as we were talking, I said, "I love your use of practical effects." And he lit up like a Christmas tree. And we just started talking about practical effects, so I know how much mm -hmm. he loves them. I'm curious about his reaction when you told him, "I think we can get this across the line. I think we can do it." <laughs> I didn't talk to him in person about that. Oh. Uh, what I did is. Um, uh, I put together a CAD model of, of what I was proposing for this motion control system. And it was kind of the minimum deliverable. Like what's the, what's the least amount that uh, we would need to put together to, to be able to do the kinds of shots we were talking about. And I was looking at our shooting space. You know, we have this uh, uh, motion capture and element shooting stage at ILM that's 50 feet by 50 feet uh, with a uh, 25 foot ceiling. And uh, so I figured, all right, if I've got a, if I put the track diagonally, uh, I can have a 50 foot track or so. And that's probably about the practical limit uh, that I can do inside the space we've got. And then looking at the kinds of shots that they wanted to do, um, you know, you have to figure out what's the scale of model that you want to build. Uh, right. And it's, it's trade off, right? Because the, uh, uh, the bigger the model you build, the closer you can get to it. Um, so you can get these nice detail shots on it, but then you're limited uh, as to how small it can be at the far end of the track, right? So um, we 
going back and forth a bit and I got um, a 3D scene file of one of the type of shots that they wanted to be able to, to do. Um, I started playing around with, um, with different scales of the razor crest and it looked like between 18 inches and two feet was the sweet spot where you know you could put enough detail into it yeah. um, that you could get reasonably close to it but you could also do dynamic shots where you get far enough away from it and you and as, as you know the uh on the first star wars film the millennium falcon was this beautiful six foot long model <gasps> so and, beautiful that one and the original dykstra flex had a uh, 40 foot track oh and, wow and you can see it in the shots that the <laughs> Falcon never gets far away from camera. You know? <laughs> uh, and, and so then on Empire Strikes Back, um, a two foot model was built and they used both. You know, if you need to get close to the, use the six footer. And if you need to get far away from it, use the two footer. And of course, obviously uh, you can add more detail if you hire someone like John Goodson. So John, I'm curious, What's it like to get a call to build a model for a Star Wars movie? I, I, I think you might have thought that that was completely done. Well, yeah. And, and I think the little doc that's running on, you know, on YouTube right now, I'm saying at the beginning, I'm like, yeah, that sounds great and everything, but it'll never happen. And then it did. And because we've talked about things like that in the past, it, it comes up and it's a nice idea and people love it, but it just never, it usually never gets off the ground. So I thought this is another one of those like, yeah, we want to do a practical model. I'm like, great. Sure. I'll, you know, I'll, that'll just fall off the back <laughs> then we actually were doing it and it was really kind of a shock and the whole thing I mean, i've been i've never stopped building models but the last 15 years i was at ilm i was doing computer graphics and it's really interesting to go back to doing what i was doing when i first started there the first 15 years i was there that's what i was doing we're doing you know ships on ships, motion control and it was just like you know like they say it's like riding a bike it's like you go right back to the same things and walking out to do stage support it could have been yesterday. It felt exactly the same, you know? So, well, so I'm really curious about this because I remember when Fogler, when Dave Fogler, who we all know, um, shifted, like you did, John, from practical model making to CG model making, he said to me, he reported, you know, it feels like the same in my brain, he said. I'm still doing the same kinds of problem solving. But I'm curious, John Goodson, if like building a model from a Doug Chang drawing for a Star Wars film, if there's some part of the process you had forgotten like, oh, this is really neat, or some... Well, you know, this was different because, you know, Landis Fields 3D printed the model. So we started off with the 3D print, but it was interesting because it came in about 50 pieces. It was like getting a deck of cards. Oh, my God. And, I looked at it, I'm like, and it's got all that support structure and everything on it. I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at, and I don't know how right. this goes together. So he made me a color-coded map that showed all the pieces so I could figure this thing out. So it was a little different than, you know, when you're building something from scratch, right. you know, and that, that's one of the things I say is really different between working in the computer and working in a physical shop. One of the things I really like is in a real shop, you can go and you can pick up a Formula One race car body and maybe they're done detergent bottle and you put these two things together and you go, wow, that's a really cool shape. Right. Well, computer graphics doesn't give you that. You don't have that kind of exploration there. You're kind of stuck with, here's a drawing, make that thing. And so that, that's one of the things I think is really different. And sometimes, you know, if you look at all of the concept models that were done at ILM, physical concept models, so many of them were just kit parts slammed together and that became yeah. the basis for, you just look at the speeder bike, the back end, the exhausts are actually the nose of a space shuttle, you know, cut off and flipped upside down and it doesn't have the windshield in it. You, if you look at it, it's clearly obvious what it is, but that went from a concept model up to full size. Right. And that's what we've all been looking at since Return of the Jedi in 83 is, you know, that sort of kit bash thing. So I, I, when we worked together at ILM, I, I think we represented a couple of factions. You used to make fun of me for overuse of the laser cutter. And I was repeatedly astounded by what you could render in styrene in incredibly short periods of time. So I'm curious as a modeler, what the process was like for you using a 3D model. Were there aspects in which you like had to improve the model because the, the CG drawing didn't uh, provide enough surface detail? Uh, well, you know, there were a couple issues with that. One of them was that we had, you know, resolution of 3D print. Um, mm -hmm. There were build lines in the parts, and it was just because of the speed at which this thing was being produced. Right. And that's, you know, one of the things about this is that there's there are a lot of different steps involved, a lot of people involved from the initial concept through development, through the art department, 
And then if you go into execution of it as a digital model or then as a practical model, and then all of them have their challenges. And so, you know, the practical thing, it was, you know, getting, getting all those pieces, putting them together. And that was, I've got the pattern. I don't know how well we can see this. It's black. But this is the pattern for the body. And this is about 40 something pieces. Wow. Comprise this thing. But when I got it all together, I was like, there are a couple of things going on. You've got to get rid of all the seams where you put the piece together and you got to clean up the build lines because this was going to be covered in foil. Right. But then you also have to be able to go through and cut out all the mount doors and everything and make those as seamless as you can so you can't see them. The 3D print material, you try to drill a hole in it, it just explodes. Oh. So, and it's very delicate. And you can see that when I was taking this out of the mold, all these white patches of putty, that's not falling apart just trying to get it out of the mold. So it didn't seem resilient enough to me to make a shooting model out of it. Got it. So it took this and made a two-part mold and split it right along this wing edge. Oh. And that allowed me to have a top and a bottom and just recast it in epoxy fiberglass. Then I had the luxury of being able to cut out the doors and make everything fit. And I could work on it like a real model. The three D the three D print parts, I start handling like a real model and I break them all to pieces. <laughs> so And and this is also this was being done in your garage while John Knoll, you're building the Moco rig in your garage. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a little machine shop in my garage, and um, uh, yeah, the, the the fun thing about uh, about the motion control system uh, is that it's you know, it exercises all three of the you know the three pillars of engineering. You know, there's the physical uh, mechanism, building mm -hmm. uh, uh, motorized pieces that'll uh, pan and tilt the camera, that'll hold the uh, the model and rotate it in uh, three axes, uh, move the camera down the track. Uh, and so that's a, a machinist uh, uh, job. And then there's the uh, electronics, you know, what, soldering up uh, all the electronics to, to drive the thing. And then the software stack, um, writing the software that runs on the, the microcontrollers that, uh, that um, runs the whole motion control system. So it was, yeah, super fun. Um, you know, cutting, cutting metal, uh, soldering, wires and writing software well yeah what could be better yeah um <clears throat> so what is it like on day one it, there must have been a lot of excitement as you're setting up to do a motion control shot oh on yeah the stage yeah yeah we so we have this whole plan uh that you know when we got the green light to uh you know, i presented my proposal of uh all right this is the budget i need to to build a this motion control system and uh um, we figured if we start today you know this was in uh, i think january i submitted the proposal and we got an approval um that if we start today john can have the model done uh, in time for the shoot in in may uh, that gives me enough time to machine the parts i need to make to build the electronics to write the software um, so we were targeting uh i think mid-may for uh, for doing the shoot and uh then every yes all right go and uh, and we started <laughs> started uh into the process and uh you know for me the first thing is uh, all right well i need the hardware first so let me start building stuff like that um get it going uh and then um i was probably oh two-thirds of the way through getting all the the hardware machined um when i think john had uh, sent some pictures of uh, of the miniature in progress and Favreau got super excited about uh, uh, <laughs> about oh hey can we uh, is there any way we can we can show something at celebration oh, oh no which meant uh, moving the time table up five weeks and this was such a mad scramble that um, like the old days yeah uh, you know that immediately we started uh, talking about all right well uh, what uh, what kind of shot could we do five weeks early? Um, and John, what, what part of the, if we only are going to show one <laughs> side of the model, <laughs> can you detail enough of it to get it to be shootable for this one shot? And that was where they were like, well, we could do this one shot just from the front and it's just going to rock and roll. I'm like, okay, I didn't get the front done. And then they had the meeting and they were like, well, now it's two shots. And then they sent me the automatic and, I said, well, what do you, what do you not see? And they sent me the shots and it, it flies by and you see the front, the bottom, the side and the back. And then the next <laughs> shot flies by the front, 
the top, the side, and the back. And I said, so the only thing you don't see is the mirror on the left-hand side. That's about it. So you guys really narrowed this down to something. <laughs> <laughs> we narrowed I make it down five to of just the six sides. Of the model. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love John getting excited. Excited. Part of me in thinking through this is like we're all still ten years old, going, Shh, you know. And it's like yeah. as soon as we're playing around with a process and that's close to this, everyone gets like, I, I in the in the featurette, there's like shots of people visiting the set, and there's that same grin on everybody's face of like oh, yeah, seeing yeah. the physical thing. It had been a while since we'd done a motion control shoot, and. Um, yeah, a lot of the people who were working at the company had, you know, weren't working there when we were still shooting those elements. So this was something kind of ex exciting and exotic, uh, fun retro thing. And they were really excited to come. Can I come by and just see it working? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had a pretty steady parade of people that uh, that wanted to just see the system running. I I think that there's something. I mean, did you find in the process of setting this up that it allowed production to be more creative in interesting and new ways that they than they could have been with CG with CG models. <laughs> no, and it's it's sort of the opposite. It's it's um, uh, in that you have to make commitments. You have to make firm commitments to the design of the shot because once About you shot it, what's possible in the shot? Uh, oh well, yeah, there's there's some limitations um, and the, the referred to in the the little documentary piece about uh, you have to think about how the model is going to get mounted right and uh, um, and you know one of the things I, I starting to talk about in that uh, that documentary is that uh, um, some of the shot designs were such that uh, you, know, you start with the ship flying towards camera and you pan with it as it's flying away and it always has some sort of role to it and the original model movers that were done for New Hope were two axis movers. It was a pylon with the motorized rotator. So the, uh, you know, the post that the model is mounted on can rotate. And then that pylon is mounted on a turntable. So you have that to roll axis and you have a yaw axis. And you notice in New Hope, there is not a single shot that is that design where you start uh, looking at the front of the ship and pan with it as it goes away because you think about it, there's a, how do you mount the model? Uh, you'd have, you have to mount it on the off camera side. So you can't really do a nose mount and you can't do a tail mount because the nose mount's gonna be visible at the front. You know, the pylon's gonna right, be over right. the top of the model. And uh, then as you pan with it and it goes away, the pylon's gonna be over the back of it. So you have to do a bottom mount or a side mount, something that, that is gonna be on the far side of the model. But then how do you do the roll on the model as it goes away? Uh, you need a three axis mover to do that. Uh, you need that sort of cradle mechanism. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at first I, I had uh, proposed, all right, well, we're gonna embrace those limitations and uh, I'm gonna just build a two axis mover like the, the ones on New Hope. Uh, but then as soon as I saw the wish list of the kinds of shots they wanted to do, half of them were these, uh, you know, fly by with a, with a roll. And I realized that, uh, all right, well, there's no way around this. I got to build a uh, cradle as well. So we've got a full three axis movie. Um, John Goodson, I'm curious if working with the model on set was all the same stuff extent. Were you doing little paint touch-ups for the model shot to shot and- Exactly the same, nothing. <laughs> that's the weird thing was walking out and, and starting to do that. And it was, there's been a 15 year gap and it was like yesterday. It was, ex wow. you know, muscle memory kicks in. It's just the same thing. And John was really patient. I, I come in, John, he was great in terms of giving me time to work on stuff. So I really appreciate that. You yeah, know, what? something else, going back to the, the garage thing. Yeah. We had one other guy involved with this guy named Dan Petrascu. And Dan has a machine shop in his garage. And he built the armature and has helped me out with a variety of things on it. And uh, we jokingly call ourselves Three Garage Productions. Because that's... <laughs> <laughs> I, I respectfully submit my garage here for anything you might need for the next season. Please call me, send me in coach. I'm ready to come help. I want to come in bed with you for a day, Goodson. I want to come be your assistant on this next time. Oh God, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was really curious to see uh, that uh, – the solution you came up with for the daytime MoCo shots for oh, the Razor yeah. Crest. That blew yeah. my mind. Tell me about that. Um, 
Yeah, the razor crest is especially tricky because it's that um, reflective metallic surface, and so it's. Oh, and actually, sorry to derail, but as a side yeah. tangent, looking at you covering the razor crest, John, reminded me of that weekend we all spent covering the Queen ship in mylar to get that perfect shooting finish. That, but that thing, I remember that thing would it would wrinkle every night. Overnight, it would wrinkle because of the mylar, and so we would seam it, and there'd be a panel line, and so you know it took a week for that thing to stop deforming <laughs> i just remember long days of anyway sorry go ahead John. <laughs> yeah no those metallic finishes are hard to do uh, yeah it, so the razor crest reflects the whole environment around it i mean that's basically what you're seeing is just a mm -hmm. reflection of the environment and um and for space shots it was relatively straightforward to light because you really just need a key and you know a couple of artfully placed bounce cards to, to really get it to look nice um, and there's a level of stylization that is perfectly fine with those space shots. But when you see it in atmosphere, um, you know, it's going to look wrong if we do a kind of slapdash uh, shooting of uh, or trying to emulate that lighting because you just won't get the right thing. It, it should be reflecting all the colors of the environment and this very subtle gradient of the, the way the sky is brighter at the horizon and, uh, and dimmer up uh, above. So. Um, you know, I, I thought, uh, well, hey, this is the Mandalorian. We're doing um, we're doing this uh, shooting stage down in Southern California with uh, LEDs all surrounding. They're they're doing uh, the equivalent of image based lighting back in the real world. Um, you know, I, I could do a little miniature version of that for these shots. And so the thought was, well, you want to surround the Razor Crest with uh, with imagery that is the right color, the right uh, tones, and with the right gradients. Uh, to try and get that same sort of look. And so we built this thing that we called the gazebo that was uh, basically uh, enclosing the whole razor crest in foam core boards. And then we arranged from below a couple of cinema projectors that uh, that could uh, illuminate the inside of the foam core and provide that uh, reflective environment for the razor crest. So you built a mini volume yes. so that the reflections would work in the environment you put it in. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Had that ever been done before back in the old days? Um, we, well, not, not exactly like that, uh, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some, some great old pictures of the ET mothership, um, which was highly reflective. Um, and they, they did a trick where they needed to recreate the environment around it. And, you know, it's supposed to be in a clearing in the, in the forest um, at magic hour. And so you would expect that the horizon glow would be broken up by, uh, by a tree line. Um, so if you look at those pictures, you can see that, that uh, folks are cutting out trees and kind of placing them around uh, illuminated foam core around yeah. it. So they're, they're doing sort of an analog version of that, that technique. Um, you know, John, and John, both of your careers have 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 spanned so many iterations of the technologies. Um, I'm and you talk about the limitations of the equipment for Star Wars, and I know, like for Rogue One, you actually utilize some of those limitations to obtain extra realistic or uh, original trilogy looking model shots. I'm curious mm -hmm. if there were in in going back to a motion control shot, if there were limitations you had forgotten about that were like reinvigorated in your head like oh i didn't i had i had yeah i wonder if there's stuff that you forgot about that you were reminded of in setting it up again yeah i you know one of the things that you see a lot uh, now are and i'm this is a pet peeve of mine is impossible <laughs> camera angles yeah um, or a camera moves where the, the camera does something that if all of this were real you could never shoot um and i'm a big fan of at least going through the thought process of if this were all real, how would you be shooting it? What kind of camera is right. this? Is this a helicopter? Is this a camera car? Is this a rigid mount? Um, and then what, what sort of aesthetic things flow from those kinds of uh, constraints? And, uh, it, you know, there, there were definitely uh, things to be thinking about. Um, how big is the camera? Is it going to clear the model? Right. Uh, so as we were working on shot design, we had to make sure that, uh, all right, well, the camera can't intersect the model, and where does the model <laughs> mover go? Um, that so that it isn't going to collide with with anything. And um, 
is this uh, a shot that actually can be done with this miniature? Because as much detail as was in it, there's a limit to how close you can get to it before it, it yeah, kind of yeah. looks like a model now. But well, do you um, feel like that anchors the audience in the re in in a in a a, a more a higher veracity reality? Well, that's that's the thought. Yeah, is that you don't want to uh, be hitting the the audience over the head with uh, with evidence, just visual evidence that what they're seeing isn't real. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, John Goodson, I, I know both of you, Johns. I'm, I'm, we're not to talk about um, further seasons of The Mandalorian, but um, <laughs> are you excited about the idea of perhaps continuing this process of doing more of more motion control shots? Motion control shots. I know that directors like Favreau and Guillermo and th they love practical model shots, but like you said, John, they're they're expensive. Do you think that um, you're opening up a new niche industry, like returning to vinyl? Well, this work I, th I think was very successful. I, I'm I'm pleased that um, you're watching the show. You know, the model shots don't stand out as not fitting in. You know, they flow right into the rest of it. And uh, and I'll, I'll say that um, uh, the work that we did with the miniature did improve the CG. That um, as we were working on other shots that were going to be done with the CG model, we were constantly referring to the miniature and pointing at. Yeah, but see, see the way that the, this reflects here and the, the ping we're getting on these bright surfaces. We should be doing more of that on our CG model. So even though the, the miniature was only in, uh, what, 16 shots or so, they did have a pretty broad effect that improved the, the look everywhere. Um, and so there's no reason to not be doing that in uh, future <laughs> productions. Are you are you excited about building more physical models, John Goodson? You, you, I, obviously, oh, no, no. you never stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much. I think this is great. I, you know, it just it kind of blew me away that it actually happened. Yeah. You know, it just like one of those things that we you know people talk about it, but it just generally doesn't it doesn't come to pass. But yeah, it's been fantastic. And like I said, it's kind of like falling off. You know, it's like riding a bike. It's a fifteen year gap. But as soon as we're out on stage, it didn't feel like there was a gap at all. It just we picked up right where we left off. Now. It's just it, uh, it's it's a very scrappy. It's a lovely scrappy thing. You know what I mean? Like it, the, in the same way that original Star Wars was. Oh gosh, what is that, John? Nolan? Yeah. Well, this is this is the system that I built for season one. Okay. Uh, this is uh, so. This is the and it's a, as you can see from the horrific rat's nest nature of this. <laughs> this is a hand soldered prototype. And, uh, and yes, it worked, it absolutely worked. But uh, um, you know, the next step that you do after you prove out the, uh, the design decisions in a prototype is, is you try to make a little bit better version of it. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is taking the, the design with a few modifications from the season, season one setup and uh, building, designing a printed circuit board that encapsulates all that rat's nest of wiring is now in this board. Um, so uh, this potentially is going to be uh, um, a little safer in that uh, it's much less likely to uh, get caught on something and for a, a wire to break loose or something. So uh, something like that, I think, is um, sort of a fun direction to be going. Uh, that's the, this is the jog box. This is the... Uh, uh, this is the handheld component of the motion control right, right. system. And you you kind of need one of these because you can't, uh, there's so many things you need to do kind of out at the model or looking through the viewfinder um, where you're setting keyframes or, um, or moving things around. Um, and so this again, you know, this is a hand soldered prototype um, that worked and we used it for doing all that season one work. But uh, since then I've, I've started uh, and this is still a work in progress, but this is a printed circuit board that has uh, nice. um, all of that in there. And um, I have yet to machine the casing for this this new one, but uh, you know, it's, well, uh, it's if you do gear up again, generation. if you do gear up again and you need a model maker, please call me. I'm ready. I'm ready to jump in, Coach. Um, it's beautiful work that you guys did, and it's really exciting. I, I you know, working in the model shop was a, a, a special. A, a, a super special time in my life and it informs the adult that I am. And uh, I'm so glad you guys got to get your hands dirty on this production because the result is incredible. One of the things I've loved about this is I get these texts from John at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, like, 
look at the anodized parts. It'll be a photograph of the parts <laughs> that you know, or the dog box. And the fact he enjoys doing that so much, it's it's pretty thrilling to get these texts like, hey, check it out. I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> this, okay, so the um, this new um, electronics package fits into a very Ooh. 80s retro uh, uh, front panel, oh. sort of like so. <laughs> I love it. It is the most niche audience possible that you are that you are making these parts for, John. <laughs> there are there are camera operators going. Oh, I wish I had that. That is so awesome, well, guys. Thank you so much for taking me on a tour through through Mando uh, Mandalorian motion control shots. It's super exciting. Absolutely happy to happy Thanks to accommodate. <laughs>